Hey there, I'm Katie Federal. Welcome to Dirt Rich, seasonal conversations on food and farming. Today's conversation is between Jerry Ford and Sunny Ruth Child, longtime friends in Minnesota garlic and organic farming. Sunny runs Merriweather Gardens near Walnut Grove, raising garlic, poultry, vegetables, and pigs who are happy to be the cleanup crew for her orchard. Jerry raises replacement dairy heifers, grass-fed beef, and garlic with his family at Living Song Farm near Howard Lake. And while it might feel like it was only just yesterday that they were out harvesting in the hot summer sun, the weather's cooling down and it's nearing the time to plant next year's crop of garlic. So before they get back out there, they're taking some time to compare notes and philosophies as they prepare for the next season and climate unknowns. So before we get into the details, hi, Sunny. It's good to hi, Jerry. hear you and, and see you. Um, and But before we get into all the details of actually planting the garlic, let's talk about the differences and similarities in our two farms. I think some context for um, how our places are different, different and similar would be helpful to folks. What kind of topography and soil do you have at your place? So can I... Can I diverge for just a minute and tell a little story about this? When I first moved to the farm here in Minnesota, um, I was thinking about what I should do, you know, because, you know, what should I do? What should I grow? What should be my main crop? And I, of course, have been a longtime lover of garlic, which I think most people who really like to cook are. And I looked around and I saw wild lilies growing on my property and I thought, I could grow some garlic here. So I just started talking to people in my neck of the woods saying, I think I'm going to plant some garlic. And they said consistently two things. Garlic won't grow in Minnesota. And you'll never be able to sell it. Nobody here likes garlic. Nobody in Minnesota eats garlic. So hum, I said, and I planted a bunch of garlic. And I found that indeed, my ground will grow garlic. And well, the first year I had a heck of a time trying to sell any, once I started selling, it was no problem selling. So then I thought that I was really the garlic goddess, that I was the one that was making garlic growing in Minnesota happen. And then of course I started to talk to people like Jerry Ford and the other people connected like now with Garlic Festival. And I discovered that indeed I might be a garlic goddess, but in fact, garlic grows all over Minnesota and everybody does a fabulous job. So when you talk about what kind of soil do I have, um, I think, well, I have deep soil, I have dark soil, I don't have much rock in my soil. It's probably a little heavy on the heavy clay side. Um, but by the time I finish, you know, stirring in all the stuff I stir in, it's it's mealy and it works really well and it doesn't feel heavy anymore. So I guess I would say I have heavy, deep black soil with lots of clay in it, but um, garlic seems to love it. So I, you know, there you go. Is it pretty flat ground? Oh yes, oh yes. I am down in the southwest corner uh, where we have flat. I mean, if people come here and they describe this place in one word, before they realize how, realize how gorgeous it is, they always say, gee, it's flat. So yes, it's very flat here. Um, we don't have the beautiful rolling hills like some other people. No, we got flat. Well, there's the one difference uh, between your place and mine. I'm, I'm on hills. Uh, yes. All of our land is considered highly erodible, um, but we are also a heavy... Uh, heavy loam with some clay in there uh, for the people who like to get technical word Glencoe Storden type soils. Um, so, uh, Jerry, may I ask you a question? Sure. So, when you're planting your garlic, um, since you are hilly, do you find that uh, the garlic has the preference for being on the higher places or the lower places? That depends. Uh, if I knew what kind of winter we're going to have, uh, if I knew how much rain we're going to have, uh, then I would have a preference. Um, but as it is, for instance, because on the lower ground, you tend to get more snow. And if we get that more snow late, like in April, 
like in 2018 and 2019, then it can be a problem because the garlic's already coming up uh, and it can actually mash the garlic down. Um, not so much freezing, but mashing it down. Um, and so what I do is I work my way, I, I, I kind of play the spread and I work my way up and down the hills uh, in contours as I'm planting uh, so that I'm, um, okay, if we have a bad year, well, maybe some of it will do fine. And if we have a good year, um, you know, then it, it's, it, it, we can still hopefully come out of it. Um, so, and the other thing I like about hills is drainage. The water keeps right on moving through, whereas folks on flat ground have to be more conscious of, uh, of not having standing water. Um, that's one of the things, right, that we yes. want to look for, is to make sure we're not going to plant where there's standing water. Um, and we'll probably talk more about that as we, we get into, well, site selection is probably a, a good thing to talk about right now. Sure. Um, so is, uh, how do you pick which part of your farm you're going to plant in? Well, I rotate every year. I have, I use a different bed. And so I actually plan my garlic bed for a couple of years. I, I will have crop on it. And then I like to have it in clover for a while. And again, mine is flat, although, you know, I have a hill. I mean, there's probably at least a foot elevation change from in the 200 feet of rise. So this is, you know, but I find that my garlic like yours um, likes to drain well. And if I, if I put it higher on, on a, even a slight slope, um, it will do better. Um, and I, for a long time, used raised beds. But there's a point when you get into thousands of bulbs where making the raised beds becomes pretty hard work. So I'm doing less of that now. I'm, I'm amending a lot. And in fact, because I put so much compost in, um, I get some of the effect of raised beds, even if it's on a really flat area. Well, I think site selection is a very important thing because you're, if you have standing water, if the water is not moving through, then yeah, it, one of the things is disease problems, right? Right. Uh, and then the other is just, a, a, it just doesn't like to stay in the same water. I used to say it doesn't like to stay wet, but I don't know about you, Sonny, but I'm finding that it's okay to stay wet as long as that water is moving through. Well, I think too that we tend, those of us who are serious about wanting gorgeous garlic, we tend to amend a lot. And uh, when, when you amend naturally, what you're doing is encouraging a you know, myriad of growth, not just the garlic, but all, many other microorganisms and stuff. You are just like wanting everybody to grow. And so if the water sits there, you have, you have the chance of killing off a bunch of those microbes. And then having water that is somewhat tainted. I mean, so I, I totally agree with you, Jerry, that, you know, it's like when you're, when you're a teacher, it doesn't matter how much dirt is on the floor, but it really matters how often the dirt gets changed. And it's kind of like that with the water and the garlic. You know, it's good to have lots of water, but it, you're, I agree, needs to be changed, needs to have movement. Right, there's those microbes that will that occur in all soil. Right. But if they build up to a point in that wet soil, uh, there's a point at which they'll overwhelm the garlic's defenses. Yes. Um, and then there's, uh, it, and when, when you're talking about amending the soil, I know, I know that you're talking about organic matter. Yes. Compost, that sort of, we're not talking about putting synthetic fertilizers. No, no, no. Uh, if, you have to, if you have to put synthetic fertilizers, uh, grow, you try to grow garlic, not in an organic matter, in an organic way, uh, you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah, um, I agree. I, I don't mean to sound like I'm preaching there, but... Uh, well, going right back to your word, site selection, you know. Mm -hmm. if you need to add chemicals to the soil, you need a different site. Right, right. Uh, so we're looking for organic matter. Yeah. And in, in general, a high amount of organic matter that has that is available to the plants uh, 
will take care of most of the needs. Right. Well, I want to skip back a little bit, and with with we we dove right into some of the details there um, about how much are you planting, how much garlic. So in the years that I've been planting, I have gone from 6,000 to 10,000 to 8,000 to 10,000 to 6,000 to about 7,500. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and that's number of bulbs yes. that you harvest. Yes, yes, it does. Uh, you'll find that garlic growers, uh, speaking to the audience here, tend to talk more in terms of how many bulbs they're actually planting. For, and I think that's for a couple of reasons. One is we all do it pretty differently in terms of how we lay out our field. Uh, and so to talk about acres is kind of irrelevant, you know, two tenths of an acre or a tenth of an acre or whatever is, because it can be vastly different in how much that will yield and how much we're planting. Um, and then uh, the other thing is I like talking in terms of bulbs because of the kind of prices we get. You know, this is a high value crop and each and every bulb is, is, is valuable to me. You know, when you're talking about a field of commodity corn, well, what's one ear of corn? But in a field of garlic like this, a nice bulb could be worth two, three dollars. Just one bulb, right? So speaking of that, and, and I do about the same amount and it fluctuates about back and forth between a 6,000 to 8,000, 9,000 amount, kind of depending on the year um, and how, much, how well I protected my seed stock <laughs> from, from getting eaten or sold. Um, so where do you market your garlic? Um, historically, I have, I mean, Garlic Festival has been just a huge part of my marketing plan. Um, I've been doing Garlic Festival with you from the beginning and consistently. Um, and this year, of course, there was no garlic festival. So it was, it was, it was, it was a good creative challenge. You know, now what do I do? I mean, I am way out in the boonies with thousands of bulbs of gorgeous garlic. So, um, you know, you shift gears as fast as you can, you figure it out, right? And I simply uh, went on Facebook and said, I have all this garlic to sell and I'm going to be making variety packs. If you want one, be sure you tell me. So I set up enough packs and people just like came from everywhere and wanted these variety packs. Um, and so I actually sold out of garlic completely in the month of August, which I have never done before. So, you know, it, you know, you just have to be ready to punt. Um, and and take it to the next step. I mean, if what you're doing isn't going to work this time, you need to adapt quickly. I that's that's what I tell myself. So that's kind of what I did, and 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 it worked, and it worked. So I'm actually going to up my production a little. If you sell out in in August, you're not growing enough garlic. <laughs> But then, as you know, it's extremely labor intensive. It's not like you can just decide. I mean, the reason I don't grow 10,000 bulbs is that it about kills me. So whenever I try to do 10,000 bulbs, the next year I do 2,000 less. I'm not going to do that again, I say, until right. I do it the next time. But, um, but I'm going to up my production again because the truth is Minnesota can grow garlic. And the, the other truth is, People in Minnesota love good garlic. Don't let anybody tell you anything else. The truth is you provide really good quality garlic and people will wait for it all year and buy as much as they can. So there you go. I concur with that. Uh, yeah. I, 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 they, I also heard that when I first started growing garlic back in 2002. Well, you know, the Scandinavians, they don't like to buy that garlic, you know. They don't yeah. eat that spicy, well, yeah, there's a garlic festival in Finland, the country of Finland. <laughs> the, the Scandinavian countries import thousands of pounds of garlic every year. Yeah. yeah, I think it was just certain Minnesotans didn't like spicy, and now I think we've changed their minds. Um, so we're going to talk about getting seed stock to plant for folks out there who are just raring to go at uh, growing garlic, um, and and I want to 
put a plug in real quick, the Minnesota Garlic Festival, if you go to mngarlicfest.com, uh, you'll see that there's a directory of growers and there's over 20 growers there who have done all the right things. Uh, and you can buy your seed garlic and food garlic from them um, and, and you know get around people like, uh, like Sonny and myself who are already sold out for this year. Um, and, and I also do market at the Garlic Festival and I did shift gears too. I went ahead and went with a full e-commerce website this year uh, and that uh, went like gangbusters and also ended up selling out um, before the end of August, uh, which is a great problem to have. Um, so if we're thinking about buying seed stock, uh, and we tend to say seed garlic or seed stock, not stock, not um, garlic seed, uh, because we're not actually planting seeds, are we? We're planting the actual cloves. Think bulb plants like lilies. Garlic is in the lily family. You're not planting seeds, you're planting cloves. So in looking for seed garlic, Sonny, what, if you had to pick the three or two most important things about selecting seed garlic, what, what is it you look for? So uh, one of the first lessons I learned when I, was, when I was about to grow garlic, and this is actually, you and I started, I think, exactly the same year, Jerry, and there was nobody local to buy from at that point. So I bought some garlic from the garlic store in Washington State or something. It came from the Okanagan. It was pretty good garlic, but I planted it and it lost size rather than gaining size. I bought some from another garlic store in Colorado and I had the same experience. Um, it lost size rather than gaining size. I bought some from somebody in Ontario one year and it came in smaller than the garlic I sell and I, I spent a fortune for it. So these are some of the reasons that I decided that because we are in fact planting embryos, we are not planting seeds, that we need to, we need to plant in soil that is as familiar to that embryo as possible. That means we need to buy garlic that was raised here. And then as soon as we start a garlic festival, I now buy all of my incoming planting material from Minnesota growers because I do it for the garlic's sake. I figure that it is much more comfortable um, with, you know, moving next door rather than, than bringing stuff in from out of state or even out of country. So I think location is really important. The other thing, of course, is variety. Not all varieties do well in all soils. We all know that. And I, and I think with my heavier clay soil, the Eastern Europeans do really well. The Russians do really well. Um, a few of the Mediterraneans do really well, but the soft necks just don't do well. And I tried some Spanish Roja. Now that should have grown, it, it just didn't do well. So um, the variety really does make a difference. If you are bringing in a variety that developed in a climate similar to the one that you have in a soil similar to the soil you have, it's got a much better chance of making its adaptation. Yeah, I would agree with that a wholeheartedly. I've never used the metaphor of their embryos before. Uh, but they I are. Like that. Yeah, I like that. Um, and you're, you're, you're literally transplanting. Yes. As yes. opposed to starting from seed. Right. And, and we could go down the rabbit hole of why there's no garlic seed right now and everything is seed garlic, but maybe we'll save that for a different podcast. Um, so you're saying local. Yes. is better, but both because it's acclimated to the climate and to the kind of soil. Right. And then varietal choice uh, plays into that as well. Right. Um, I would add to that disease testing. Uh, it's very important there. When, I, when we first started, we didn't think much about diseases. There weren't a whole lot of diseases out there in garlic that that affected ours. We were kind of insulated. <clears throat> well, now it's, that's not true anymore. There's all kinds of diseases coming in. 
And the worst one is the garlic bloat nematode, uh, GBN. It's got its own initials now. And we have an active testing program in Minnesota for that. And you can read about that on the Garlic Festival webpage uh, um, on the Sustainable Farming Association website. Um, so ask your, if when you're buying, ask if they test for disease. And if they don't, then I'm going to say, look at it first or find out what their return policy is. Um, uh, but preferably they do test for the garlic bloat nematode and they talk intelligently about other conditions. Um, it is wonderful to be able to see it before you buy it. If you can go to the farm uh, with social distancing in place and see the garlic, and look at the root base where it's the bottom of the bulb. See if there's any compromise there. See if it just looks funny or smells funny. Yes, garlic smells funny. But well-cured garlic, good seed garlic, won't smell until you open it up. If it does smell, there's probably something wrong. If you can smell a bad right. smell. Yeah. Right. And then, so disease testing is important. The other thing I'd say is, and you, you kind of hinted at this, um, if you want to grow big garlic and in Minnesota, when we're talking about big garlic, the bulbs can be two and a half to three inches in diameter. They can be, uh, like four of them make a pound, you know, quarter pound garlic. Um, <clears throat> we, you can achieve that here. Uh, but, and if you want to do that, the bigger you start with, the bigger you're going to get. If you start with small cloves, it's harder to get the size up. But if you start with a big clove, especially in some of these northern porcelain and purple stripe type garlics, you can be pretty well guaranteed uh, a nice big bulb after that with all other things being equal. And then do you grow a lot from your own seed stock, Sunny? I do, I do. Um... And while I know that there are lots of customers who like the three inch bulbs, um, I personally find that a two and a half inch bulb is what I like to cook with. I find I like the size. Um, so when I'm choosing my, you know, what I'm, when I'm choosing what I'm gonna hold back to plant again, which is my preference, use my own as much as possible, I select for great uniformity of clove size in the bulb, and I go for about a two and a half inch bulb with really nice looking cloves. I never plan, I make it a policy, and then of course I break my own rules, but I make it a policy to never plant a clove that I wouldn't want a whole bulb to look like. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so I will select out, I will take, what I consider to be a really nice looking bulb. And I will go around and I will select out the four, say, cloves that I think are the most perfect for what I wanna grow. And then the rest of them go in a box and that's what I eat all winter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and of course they taste just fine. But if I'm going for uniformity in clove size and a nice two inch, two and a half inch plus bulb, I don't have to, I can actually let my customers have those two and three quarter, three inch bulbs because they love them. Mm -hmm. And then I plant, so it's sort of like you take a B plus student and you really give them what they need. And by the end of the term, you got an A student. And I kind of feel that way about the garlic. You know, you pick out all those really good, just a really good looking sound piece of garlic and you plant that one. Um, and then you just let, and, and you give it what it needs. And for sure, it's gonna be premium. Well, at least that's what you tell yourself. Then there's reality. But generally speaking, I get the garlic I want when I do that. When I, when I pick out a bulb that's not the most grandiose, but just a little bit down, because I believe by the time it has had a season in my soil, provided the weather is cooperative, it's gonna be exactly what I wanna get. Oh, I would agree with that to a, a very great degree. Um, so uh, if you had to recommend 
to a new grower or home gardeners out there a variety you know okay do this one get your chops with it and then branch out which one what what variety would you tell people well i would definitely choose one of the porcelains i would choose I would choose, of course, everybody loves music, right? So there's music. German white is another one. People love that. And the other one is Polish white. It's Polish hardneck. Those three are gorgeous, gorgeous bulbs. And so while I personally may think that the purples have a little nicer flavor to them, those porcelains are so gorgeous. And we're all kind of, you know, we're all kind of that way. We like what we're putting out there to look good, right? And so that's what I would say. A first time grower, I would say one of those really strong porcelains. Music hard, uh, Polish hardneck or German white, always great. Well, and I would uh, concur with the porcelain family. Folks may not know, there's um, 11 families of garlic. And within those families, there are well over 100 varieties. You know, garlic, it's not just garlic out there. Um, and, the, and we could go into more detail about that. But again, that's probably a different podcast. I concur on the porcelains. They are just so much easier to grow. They taste great. They store great. Um, and I would throw out, um, uh, I love music. And that's the name of it. It's not, I love music. Well, yeah, who doesn't? No, it's the name of the garlic. Uh, and I also really like uh, the Armenian variety. Yeah, um, that's a beauty. Yeah, and, and so those those all are are good starter garlics. And I only I grow three different porcelains and one purple stripe, and that's what I've settled on. Um, so yeah, that's that that's a good recommendation. Um, all right, so you talked about in terms of preparing our ground for garlic. You, you touched on earlier adding, amending the soil with compost. Uh, is there anything else that you do to the soil? Yeah, I, you know, garlic is kind of um, the high point of each of my bed cycle. So I usually, the year before, I'm already thinking about the garlic. Like right now, I've got a bed that is a North American garden. It's got tomatoes and peppers and um beans and stuff like that in it and as soon as it freezes that's all going to get mowed and chopped up and put in i also mulched real heavily with garlic with um with compost in that bed this year so the compost which i get from a neighboring city and isn't actually fully developed which is an argument i know it's an argument and it's problematic it's also it's also a good thing to do if it's what you have it's it's a good thing to do so I use tonnage of compost as a mulch on other crops the year before I'm going to do my garlic. So by the time I'm planting the garlic, the compost is actually matured. I also spread it with blood meal. Um, I spread it with, I take a bag of hog mineral. It's just sort of like, it's, it just makes sure that all my minerals are covered, just like, it, just like it's included in my hog feed just to make sure they're covered. You know, it's the multiple vitamin you take in the morning kind of thing. Um, and and, I, and I, I like to add kelp. I, I will buy a couple bags of kelp and sprinkle some of that over too. I think that it actually expands the inner node a little bit and that gives you a little more size and, and it's health enhancing and it's, you know, it takes toxicity out of the soil and, and, and deposits and all of that stuff. So all of the, those things go in and they get tilled in um, one week and then I'll let it set for a week and then they'll get tilled in again and I'll let it set for a week. And then when I'm actually ready to plant, I will till one last time and it's really mealy. The reason, and I know you didn't ask this question yet, but the reason I like it that way is because from the tip of my finger to the tip of my thumb is eight inches. And that's the measure of how far apart I'd like to keep my garlic. If I got a really mealy soil, I can take my thumb and push a clove in, look where my finger is, put my other thumb on, push in a clove, and, and that's all there is. There's no template, there's no measuring. 
It's just ding, 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 ding. I walk across the soil with my thumb and my finger and the garlic goes in plenty deep enough and it covers in a, in a, in a dream. So that's what I do. I really puff it up and I get it full of organic and minerals and the, all of those kinds of stuff. And then I just push those sweet little babies into their nice little snug home. <laughs> Uh, well, I, it, uh, it, it sounds like a perfect approach uh, and, and um, yeah, almost an intuitive approach. Um, I come at it a little bit more from um, uh, a scientific approach, which is odd for me to say if folks know I come from an arts background as well. Um, but I, there be a, I do have soil testing done, uh, and then I amend what needs to be. We're certified organic, and I know Sunny grows by the organic standards as well. Um, so there's certain things we can't do uh, and won't do anyway. Um, but one of the things that I'm always concerned about is the pH of the soil, the acidity or alkalinity of the soil, um, and compost can vary the pH after a certain amount of time. Garlic really likes neutral soil in, in terms of acidity or alkalinity. It wants to sit in that 6.5 range if you're measuring. Uh, so I, I am a little concerned about that, and I have used um, lime before uh, to help balance out the, uh, the acidity and alkalinity. And it seems to be one of the things that can really affect uh, your garlic production if it gets too far. And here again, Jerry, so you have hills. And if you have hills, well, hilly soil, hilly land, you get more leaching just because that's how it works. So you have more concerns with um, pH than those of us who, you know, it's got nowhere to go. I mean, so it's like our pH is probably more consistent. I'm, I'm sure it is. Uh, because we're just not, there's just no leaching, I mean, to speak of. That happens here. I suppose there's wind leaching, but that's about it. There's not water leaching as you would have. Um, and, and again, this, and I understand what you're saying about the pH in the compost, and especially when it's not compost that is worked according to heat cycles and move and having it moved and stuff. Hell, mine comes with hunks of tar and concrete in it, and sometimes oh. a rug. I mean, you know, so. This is far from finished compost. So that's why it's, you know, but it gets a year. It gets a year, which, which probably neutralizes it a lot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 Well, I, I would recommend folks, it's easy to do a pH test. There's little, yeah. you know, everything from litmus paper to little devices. And, and, you know, if you need to adjust that, there are ways to do it. Right. Uh, and they're, they're not hard to do. Um, and I like your, your spacing as well. That eight inch spacing, um, is garlic is a heavy feeder. Um, uh, it, it has kind of a striking range, a feeding range around itself. Uh, and it soaks up a lot of nitrogen. Um, so giving it space is a good thing. Um, and when we say eight inches, a lot of us do plant in beds not just a single row and then skip a foot and a half and having a, we'll plant in grids, like eight inch grids. Um, and, and that still gives the plant plenty of, of room. Um, so when do you plant, Sunny? So um, the first couple of years, and this is gonna hark back to something you said earlier. The first couple of years I was living here in Minnesota in the summer and then going back to Washington and doing my business during September to May. Then I would be back at the end of May and so on. So the first couple of years I was planting garlic, I had to plant it before I left, which meant end of August or very first of September, that's, you know, if I was gonna get the garlic in, it had to go in then. But then there were these problems that it would shoot in the fall and the snow would flatten it and there'd be all that wasted energy. And then in the spring, if it was one of those seasons where it would get started and then we'd get a snowfall, it would get flattened again and lose all that energy. And I believe that every time it goes through that cycle of trying and losing, trying and losing, 
that it doesn't fully regain that. So I have I have gone later and later um, until one year I actually planted it late enough that I was planting it in snow and wet icy soil. I do not recommend that. I do not recommend that. And let me mention that I don't recommend that. That's a really <laughs> miserable experience. But so now what I do is I wait into October. So once I get into October, you can kind of feel a switch, then it's time, it's just not gonna shoot. And if the weather goes really bad on you, the thing to do is wait a week and it'll be nice again. It's just like, um, October is one of those months. One week, it'll be beautiful fall. One week, it'll be the beginning of winter. And the next week, it'll be beautiful fall. So patience is really important, but I think that the timing for me and my farm is early October. Early October is seems to be a good compromise here. How about you? Well, I used to say my birthday, which is October 16th, is a good date to shoot for. And I think it's a very safe date to shoot for. That period of time, of course, depending on what the weather's doing, um, you're probably not going to have sprouting, um, what you're talking about with it shooting up. Um, and what garlic will do when planted in the fall, and for those who don't know, garlic, garlic needs winterization, what we call vernalization. It needs to sit through a cold period like our long winters. It loves that. Um, and very rarely do you have garlic that freezes. Um, and we'll talk more about mulching and those sorts of things. But um, that that time for beginning growers, yes, go with that mid-October, early October. If you're way up north, early October for sure. You're a little more south. You could wait even longer, like you say. With the Minnesota Premium Garlic Project that we've been running for a couple of years now, we've got a couple more years to go, we're doing some field trials. And the, the growers involved with that are planting in mid-September, some garlic, and then mid-October, and then as late as they can without fighting snow and frost and ground that you have to poke holes in uh, through the ice, um, though we, we're doing that, uh, and getting the results. And so far, the results are showing that the September stuff planted in September is getting bigger. It's producing really? better. Now, there's a caveat. Um, then between the October and November stuff, hardly any difference. So if you're planting in October right up until the ground freezes, it's not going to see a whole lot of difference. Um, the risk is if you plant in September, uh, that it will not only do what it's going to do in those other months, which is to put down roots, it will put down roots in the fall and you want it to do that. So it has a head start in spring but it will do what you mentioned. It'll put up top growth. A stalk will come up. Well, then if that gets much mashed down uh, or frozen off, uh, the bulb, the clove down in the ground is probably still okay, but it's lost all that energy, as you said. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, so it's a risk and I don't recommend it for beginning growers, um, but I do it. Uh, it you know, I like to plant some early as kind of hedging my bets. And this past year for what I harvested in 2020, it was the best. I planted September 20th on some of those. Everything else did just fine. Um, so if you're beginning, shoot for mid-October-ish around in there. If you've really got your chops and you know what you're doing with garlic, yeah, maybe plant some early. Uh, and, and if you're not too risk adverse, then, then that'll probably do fine. So, okay, one of those things that you mentioned already, Sonny, that garlic is labor intensive. The trade-offs for that labor intensive thing are that it's rich people like it, um, you know, you get a nice price for it. So, hey, your labor is compensated. Uh, and once we put it in the ground, it's there for nine months. The in-between isn't so bad. It's the planting and harvesting that are 
when it's really intense. Um, okay, so we've got to get those cloves, the individual parts of the garlic head, out of the garlic head so that we can plant them. How do you do that? How do you break apart the bulbs? When I, when I am cleaning my garlic, I leave a short inch of stem on the top, and I actually call it the thumb. And then when I need to break it apart, in one hand, I take the bulb, and with the, the um, opposing thumb, on the other hand, I, I hold the bulb firm with one hand, and I push on that little stem with the other, and it usually pulls the bulb apart. And, they, and it will mostly, the bulb will, will come apart easily if I have done that. So just pushing on what I call the thumb, pushing on the thumb, um, really loosens it up and makes it easy to separate it. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the differences in what I do is I, I never clean the garlic before I plant it. Uh, I leave it on the stalk, on the root, um, so that I've got a whole stalk to grab a hold of and, give, and even some root to grab a hold of if I need to. Um, you know, so it's, there's no reason to clean it as far as I'm concerned unless you're just cleaning all your garlic at once and then picking your seed garlic. I pick my seed garlic right out of the field. Uh, as soon as we get it in the shed, I say these are the plants that I'm going to keep for seed garlic uh, and then never clean them. You know, we, we often take them right out into the field and clean them there if I have enough help uh, or break them up there. One of the coolest little tools I have found uh, for helping with that is there's this uh, orange peeler. It's like a, just a little thing that you can, a uh, tool that you can use to wedge under the skin of an orange and then peel around it. Well, I found it's, it's soft enough that I can insert it in between the cloves and then just give it a little twist without damaging the cloves. The point is you don't want to damage those cloves. Right. Go into the ground compromised, then they're open to diseases. Um, but if, if they've still got, you can plant them without the skin on them, but it's nice to have it there. You just don't want to nick that clove. Um, now, having said all that, there are commercial garlic breaker upper things. I, what am I trying to call them? Uh, that, that will separate the clove from the bulb. Commercial. And there's a guy, well, there's a grower in the Twin Cities that has one. And I am so tempted to take all of my garlic over to his place and run it through there, which means I'd have to clean it first and then bring my cloves home. But I probably won't. I'll still, you know, I just sit in the evenings and pop what I'm going to plant the next day. That's what I do. And, and you know, I don't clean it either, but I do cut the tops off just right. so that it doesn't take so much room, you know. It does. It does. Well, we, I know you hang your garlic for curing. I do. Yeah. Uh, up in a hayloft, right? Uh, yeah, in a barn, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember seeing that. Uh, um, and I have a, a pole shed right. that I can heat if I need to. Right. But usually by October, I don't need to, you know. Right. Um, uh, and garlic will stand, it, it's fine down to 30 degrees or so. You know, it's yeah. not going to damage the garlic. I agree. Um, and I just, I put it in bundles and hang it in that shed for curing. And right. that's a different topic. Um, and, and then I just take that bundle down and go straight out to, to cleaning from there. Um, what that does, it, it, then I have to rogue things out. If I find cloves that I don't want to plant, maybe they got nicked, maybe they're too small. Well, I'm doing that as I'm going. Right. Um, whereas some people like to pick out their seed garlic in advance. So I think as growers, it doesn't really matter. I mean, garlic, certainly apples, certainly other things, tomatoes, you know, you call constantly, mm -hmm. you know, you just all the time calling, you're all the time refining, you're all the time making sure it's exactly what you want to end up with. Yeah. 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 Well, now, let me ask you this. Do you do any kind of dip treatments for your seed? Any no. Kind of, yeah. I don't either. Um, though with the, Premium Garlic Project, we did uh, uh, some field trials about that. Uh, and the dip involved some fertilizer that like fish emulsion, organic approved, that you would leave it 
in that fish emulsion water overnight. And the idea being that it's going to take up some nutrients and have a little charge ahead of time. We found Can you that imagine that. planting that? I know it's going to, I mean, yeah. it's oil it smells. Yeah. That's gross. Anyway. No, it is. It's like dead fish. Um, yes. Yeah, and then the cats come and dig up your garlic. Yes. Uh, but uh, no, I don't know if that happens or not. But the, and then the other idea was, well, what if there's some disease on that, those cloves? They're going to grow like crazy. Right. <laughs> uh, so we also did a dip treatment tri uh, trials with alcohol, uh, you know, like vodka, and dipping it for an hour or so to supposedly kill off some of the pathogens. Yeah. Um, and and there was a nice little side benefit to doing that because you know right. some goes for the seed, some goes for the grower. Right. Um, and again, we found no difference. Um, if so, if, if I may object for just a second. <laughs> um, and this is a this is a this is philosophy more than science. Okay. So my 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 thing is this: there is agriculture which is about management and control and there is ecology which is about letting go of that and trusting nature and i i tend more and more as i go you know into this to think that you need to trust you know you need to do everything you can to to help out a little bit and then you need to trust. So like dipping cloves in fish, to me, in, invites disease. And dipping it in alcohol, to me, is like killing many of the organisms that the clove actually needs. So why not trust that this, this augmented and celebrated soil and this well-loved garlic are going to figure it out. I mean, they're going to figure it out. Um, we're not always we're not always smart when we when we try too hard. Well, I would concur that um, I don't do the dips except when you know we're doing a, a trial on it, and we abandoned that trial. We were just like, this is a waste of time. This and if you're doing any. Yeah, and if you're doing, now many people swear by it. And if you've got a prevalent disease problem and you can't get different seed garlic and you can't get it out of your soil, um, you know, out east they're dealing with things like white rot and, and some of these things, then dip, you know, just to survive, you may want to do a disease treatment. Uh, or try like something different, you know, yeah, I and understand there's a, that. Yeah, and there's a, yeah, um, like move to Minnesota. And, right. Uh, um, the uh, there's also a treatment at which you heat the water up. It's like just before boiling for a very specific amount of time, but they found it also sets the garlic back. Yeah, it gets rid of the disease, but it weakens the garlic. Um, so it's, it's trade-offs. I would agree with you. Get good seed stock, get good soil, rotate. Um, you know, very I, important. Yeah, at least I, I advocate, especially for new growers, four years. Don't go back to the same place with any allium. If you're growing onions and leeks, and that can't be in between for four years. Um, I'm on about a 16-year <laughs> rotation right now. I finally come back to the same spot since 2002. Okay, how deep do you plant? I'm going to say four or five inches, and then I'm going to put mulch on a good mulch on top of that. Yeah, we'll talk about mulch in a moment. Um, yeah. So you're pushing four or five inches down. How do you get it that deep? With my thumb. Remember, I, I till my soil till it's mealy and I push it in gently with my thumb and it, no pressure, no pressure. Um, yeah, so that's about, that's about three, four inches. That's, that's all, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, and, and I like that you said that's all. Um, because I don't even go that deep. Yeah. Um, I, I, if I get the top of that clove, especially big cloves, you know, that are a little harder to push in, um, then just below the surface. <clears throat> now I'm not necessarily recommending that to people. Right. And if the soil is, is fluffy and light, 
it's going to settle too. So if well, I'm going yeah. down four inches, it's going to be, and it, it's going to be three. All right. If I go in three, it's going to be two because it's going to. And that is a little offset by, um, by the fact that garlic has tractile roots, which means that uh, the, once it starts establishing those roots, they will actually pull the garlic down. Right. Uh, it's, it's what the original garlic grown in way up in the Himalayan plateau did to survive. Right. Um, so this, it will actually do that. And I've found that certain varieties, certain family groups do it more than others. Uh, the marble purple stripe, I planted it right below the surface. When I went to harvest, it was two inches down. It had pulled itself that far down into the ground. The porcelain's not as much. Um, so people are probably saying, but it's going to freeze. How do we work with that freezing thing? You mentioned mulch. What do you, what do you do with mulching? So historically I have used straw and, and given my options, I will use straw again. But last year, the crop around here, small grain crop was really poor. And the cheapest straw was $6 a bale plus delivery. And that was exorbitant. Um, so instead, I used compost. Again, this was the young compost, which, which caused me some concern. But that's what I had. You know, sometimes you use what you have available. And so I put about two inches of this uh, of, of compost over it. And then in the spring, I found some straw that was actually affordable. And I did a second mulch with light, lightly with the straw because unfinished compost will grow weeds like crazy. Mm -hmm. And weeds is not something I like in my garlic bed. So I covered it again with um, a couple inches of straw. Um, and then, of course, I mean, you know, so these things are so problematic. So then, of course, every, every tiny kernel of oats that was in the straw uh, sprouted in the spring. And, and I had to, like, be pulling oats out of the garlic all year. So um, I, I, I do mulch. I always mulch. I always mulch with what I can get. I usually use straw. And I don't know what to do about the fact that there is still a fair amount of grain in the straw. Right you know, you develop an eye for looking at bales and seeing whether or not there's grain, because of course, to make straw, they're harvesting it after that seed is viable. Right. And the, the straw is a bit of, is kind of like a side product. Right. And how well they're combining right. uh, is, is going to affect how much seed is still, there's always going to be some. Right. Um, but you can find some really clean straw at our farm, because our partner farmer does grow corn, um, he has corn stalks and it's, we have livestock. It's the same thing we use for bedding for the livestock right. called Stover. Um, yeah. And we use corn stalks. See, which, that's lovely. Yeah. And it's, it's here. It's applying it is difficult. Yeah. Getting it out there and on, you know, it requires a heavy tractor with a front loader and grapple, but uh um, Stover also imparts heat to your soil, which is yes, nice. Yes, as it's breaking down and and very rarely is there any corn seed in that stover, you know, right. so you don't have volunteer corn plants coming up. But right. yeah, I've seen garlic fields that use oat straw or rye straw or have really nice oat crops out there. Right, I know. <laughs> it's so you don't you don't you don't get rid, rid of the weed problem when you use straw. It can, but, it can. But, it, but the thing is, you don't even have to take it out. You just have to pull its roots out of the ground and then leave it. So you disturb the garlic as little as possible. Right. And then, and then it, 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 it disintegrates. But, but it is, it's a pain. Yeah. It is. It's a pain. Well, and the reasons we mulch have to do with um, moisture control. Right. It keeps it kind of consistently moist. And at the same time, like we said, you want the water moving through. Right. Uh, and if you can't have it moving through, then don't irrigate. Do you, how often do you irrigate your garlic? I don't irrigate. I don't either. I, or I didn't for seven years. Eight years ago, we had a drought. Right. Um, that's different. Yeah. And, the, but for seven years, I didn't irrigate at all. Uh, and then this last year, we had that little mini drought here. Right. In June. 
and I did irrigate then for the first time in seven years. Right. But since we harvest in July, most of our really dry weather is already is not hasn't happened yet. Right. But the weather patterns are changing. So, um, so and then the mulch also helps control weeds. You know, you may get a little oats coming up, but the other weeds are suppressed to a certain degree. Uh, and there is that possibility right after planting, before that clove has put roots down, that if you don't mulch it and you get a heavy frost, it's going to heave that clove out of the ground. Uh, that can happen. But right. once it's put its roots down, it's, even that's not going to happen. Right. We actually had, and, and we're going to wrap up here in a moment, but, uh, uh, and I'll get your parting shot. We actually had a, a time when one of my crews was planting and they, they spilled some garlic, you know, and we didn't see it. It was just lying there on the ground. We didn't figure that out. And it was porcelain, one of the porcelain varieties. Uh, and we came back in the spring and found those cloves on the ground. They had put roots down and were starting to kind of turn themselves upright by pulling down with the roots. We threw mulch over it and we got some sort of nice garlic bulbs. There you go. I am not recommending broadcast seeding your garlic. But, uh, but the northern garlics, the porcelains especially, are very hardy. They are. So what have you got for a parting shot for us here? I'm going to put you on the spot, Sonny. Oh, boy. Well, you know, I guess I hadn't really thought about this, but the thing that always pops into my mind is that we need to be mindful that the climate, the climate thing is huge. And um, this summer was really hot here. I don't know if it was where you are. Mm -hmm. And I heard some meteorologists uh, laughingly say, well, instead of thinking it's the hottest summer on record, just know that it's the coolest summer for the next 100 years. And I think that is the sort of thing we need to be mindful of, um, that we have to anticipate that the climate's going to change, and we have to do our best to be one step ahead. So when you say you haven't, irrigated and for seven years until this year when you see drought uh challenges be ready to address them and when you see heat challenges be ready to address them this would be an argument for going ahead with heavier mulch i suppose i mean if you want anything that is going to help to secure your garlic it's probably to be found in mulching i mean it's just like protect it protect it. Right. Yeah. Well, that, I think that's a, uh, I, I agree with you hundred percent about the climate change thing and being adaptive yes. to it. Uh, we're Be seeing ready. all ranges of farming now um, with livestock, especially. Um, and it may be that some of those more quote unquote, Southern garlics uh, may be starting to do better here. Right. I think the porcelains and purple stripes will continue to do well. Well, I think that's going to wrap us up for today, and I sure appreciate it, Sonny. Uh, it's always a delight to talk with you. And Thank you. It's always a delight to talk with you. Hopefully good to see you. Yeah, and hopefully we'll see each other in person at the festival next year. Very good. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Dirt Rich is produced by the Sustainable Farming Association. We believe that agriculture, done well, heals. For more resources or to tap into the Farmer to Farmer Network, visit us at sfa-mn.org.